uh, good evening or afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, this is our first uh, BCI webinar. Let's see if you like it, if you learn something. We have three great speakers this afternoon, Dr. Henderson, Dr. Lutart, and Dr. Moko. And uh, I'm going to lead off with a few general comments, and then we'll have time at the end for 20 minutes or so of uh, Q&A, and you can submit any questions to Monica. So, you know, you know, the vast majority, almost all of BCI has been the concept of uh, on the surface or uh, sort of blind electrodes, uh, as we all know, to subserve a, a certain functionality. But the fact is, uh, probably 99% of the real estate of the brain is subcortical or internal. And so a lot of potential targets as, as uh, this evolves. And I, I thought it was uh, uh, important to just ponder for a minute the, the development of the microprocessor and uh, you know, for those who remember the uh, the uh, vacuum tubes, which were an enclosed method of of uh, having um, uh, microprocessors or having transistors, really, in 1971, Intel came out with the 4004 microprocessor that had 2,300 transistors, four bits of data, and you can see the rest of the specs there. And I think maybe you can see on the right-hand side, hopefully some of the pioneers, Fagan, uh, Mazur, and Hoff, and then at the bottom, uh, Andrew Grove, Robert Noyce, Gordon Moore from 1971. But as you're all aware, the, uh, the development continued as more and more transistors were able to be placed, the uh, operations per second massively increased. And now in just 50 years, we have had a billion times an increase in the computer power uh, at our fingertips. In terms of intracranial implantable technology, uh, certainly uh, as we know, there are uh, responsive systems such as NeuroPACE. There are strip electrodes, particularly to access the sensory motor cortex uh, for paralyzed patients. There are deep brain electrodes uh, and then more recently, you know, Synchron has come out with a uh, 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 device that's placed through the blood vessels. To my knowledge, it's not FDA approved yet, uh, but we'll probably hear more about that uh, later today. The question is, uh, as we evolve to the right, is it possible to downsize integrated circuits and put an actual more performing device subcortical and we're well aware of the major fasciculi, the, neuro, the neuroscientists uh, tell us there's a hundred billion neurons in our brains, four times that many supporting cells. And if you take all these connecting fibers, it would be over a hundred thousand miles. And here we are now with a very uh, enabled operating room operating through small openings, transocal, and at times with fluorescence and other uh, things to enable us to see better beyond just our, our uh, white light in the vision, vision, normal vision spectrum. Uh, we have been very interested, uh, certainly at the subcortical surgery group in, in the uh, idea of transocal parafascicular minimally invasive or MIPS approach. Uh, this was a paper from neurosurgery about five years ago showing the feasibility for IC8. So, uh, as we look to not only take things out of the brain, uh, maybe in the near future, we're going to be putting things back in. And this would be in the area of regenerative medicine, but also perhaps uh, BCI and AI. There have been over 30,000 cases done with the NICO uh, brain path uh, uh, access device. And as you well know, the innovation history has been replete in neurosurgery and, and really sets us up as a specialty that uh, uh, loves to implement uh, new technology. And I would think AI and BCI is right in our sweet spot. And soon we will be going to some form of robotic assisted surgery, no question. Uh, we've done some work with, with uh, 
uh, this concept and we developed with uh, Nico's assistance, particularly uh, Mr. Joe Mark and uh, Jim Pearson, the CEO, a modified tubular retractor for a rodent. And we have tried to implant uh, two different sizes, very small uh, integrated circuits. And uh, we performed this in 12 animals. Uh, we recovered them normally and sacrificed it one in three months. And here's sort of the, the device you can see in the upper right, the very small integrated circuit. And then you can see how we put uh, two perforating holes in the vertex of the rodent skull. And then with a modified brain path device inserted uh, the, the integrated circuit into the subcortical uh, white matter uh, in the frontal lobes. You see on the bottom right that something we call cerebral nutrient factor was uh, placed first. That's a fatty acid oil base with a couple other things to help uh, facilitate insertion and to hopefully cut down on associated scar tissue. This shows the uh, device uh, pushing the small IC into the frontal lobe subcortical white matter. Uh, we also tried larger integrated circuits. You can see this on block uh, uh, depiction here. And then as we sacrifice the animals at uh, one month and three months, uh, we got the expected track changes uh, with uh, peri, peri lesion infarction and uh, infiltration of some macrophages and uh, uh, G, GFAP positive reactive astrocytes. One issue is that uh, this is an animal in three months, the microtome does cut across the IC and you see the remnants of it uh, there. But again, with uh, hemosiderin laden macrophage surrounding the remnants of the chip, and then also the, uh, as I mentioned, the GFAP reactive astrocytes, only scattered CD3 positive T lymphocytes were found. So we're very excited about uh, the concept of subcortical BCI and implantation of a device beyond an electrode. And we think that it is technically feasible and to gain subcortical access Again, instead of always taking things out, uh, we believe that things can be inserted and maybe not just stem cells or other, other uh, chemical or, or biological reactive uh, substance, but also um, uh, a BCI concept. And these 12 animals, they recovered normally. There were no post-operative infections or healing problems. Uh, they, uh, um, went on to lead a normal life until they were sacrificed. Uh, we did not assess uh, uh, integrated circuit functionality in this first feasibility study, which was really more for our delivery system and the concept of could a, a rodent recover without known side effects. So there's a, a, a lot of steps that will need to be taken. Of course, we have just scratched the surface. The question is, um, is it a wearable or surgically implanted device? Is that the next step? Uh, we believe that the risk, at least in this initial pilot study in rodents, showed that it was possible without undue side effects. Uh, we know certainly that there are currently uh, BCI applications, cochlear implants, visual implants, uh, motor, motor sensing uh, and sensory sensing uh, 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 cortical strips. Uh, we've done uh, RNS for seizures like uh, Neuropace that has both a sensing and a stimulating function. Uh, a lot of issues to consider, of course, and hopefully we'll get into some of that today as we scratch the surface, the long-term health, including psychological of the patient. Uh, the, uh, the, this, the issue called authenticity, are we empowering the abilities of the patient on his, uh, for his or her own? Uh, what are the ethical aspects of that? Uh, and the future of BCI may include uh, uh, incorporation of AI for so-called enhanced cognition. Um, 
certainly we don't know everything about the future of neurosurgery, but I believe these tenets are probably going to be true. It's going to be minimally invasive. It's going to be image guided. It's going to have superior diagnostic imaging. It's going to be robotically placed, precise, safe, efficient. And then uh, uh, what will it be? Will it be something silicon enabled? Uh, will it be uh, something externally connected uh, uh, with, uh, say, Bluetooth technology? Uh, what about regeneration and reprogramming of cells and brain circuitry for, uh, for net neural networks? So I'll stop there. I'm going to turn it over to the real experts. The first is Dr. Henderson from the Department of Neurosurgery at uh, Stanford. Uh, he will be followed by our, our second uh, speaker, Dr. Lutart, and then our third is Dr. Moko. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll have some time, I think, for uh, Q&A at the end. So, uh, Jamie, I'll turn it over to you. Outstanding. Thanks, Julian. Uh, I, uh, I, liked your, I liked your comment about scratching the surface. That's uh, just what I intend to do, as we'll, we'll start... Uh, a little bit more superficially, I know the, the main focus here is on subcortical, but I'm going to start off talking a little bit about uh, some cortical technologies. So if you wouldn't, if you, there we go. Okay, I'll share my screen. Okay, everybody see that okay? Tell you what, let me make sure that I've got this uh, properly done, optimized for video. Okay, great. Uh, one second. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to talk about my work with the uh, Neural Prosthetics Translational Laboratory. This is a lab at Stanford that I direct with uh, a biomedical engineer or a electrical engineer, neuroscientist, Krishna Shinoy. So we're uh, really uh, uh, co-directors and co-PIs on all of our grants and uh, work very closely together. I do have a couple disclosures. I uh, uh, I'm on the advisory board for a little company called Inspire DBS, and I also consult for a company called Neuralink. Uh, with both of these companies, I'm a, I'm a shareholder. All right, so the, the problem that we're here trying to address is that of paralysis. Many of you remember Christopher Reeve, the uh, you know, actor who played Superman in the movies. He was involved in a horseback riding accident, which uh, during which he, under, uh, he uh, suffered a C1 uh, fracture and became instantly paralyzed. Uh, he was ventilator dependent uh, after this. And if you, you know, obviously if you look at his brain, uh, there really isn't anything wrong with it. He's able to speak, he's able to present, uh, he's able to run uh, a, <laughs> you know, a very successful philanthropy. The problem of course, is that there's an interruption between the cortex and, and the distal parts of the body. So the question that uh, was posed many years ago is, what happens to the neurons in the motor cortex uh, when an injury like this happens? Uh, while our degeneration or in other processes, reorganization, one might expect that uh, the areas that control the body, particularly the arm and hand, might, uh, might no longer be functional. And it turns out that this is actually not the case. It turns out that there still are uh, very clear signals in this part of the brain that can be leveraged. So we can read these signals out, process them with a computer, and then send those uh, process signals back out into the world to do useful things like uh, run robotic arms or uh, computer cursors or other things. Our, our uh, work in the lab has focused uh, quite a lot on communication, and that's some of the work that I'm going to talk about today. So if we're going to investigate this part of the brain, there's lots of different ways to do it. Dr. Bell's talked about uh, uh, circuits that implanted in the subcortical white matter, but we use this technology, which is a silicon microelectrode array. Uh, it's uh, 10 by 10 with 100 electrodes that penetrate just into the outer layers down to about layer 3A. So this is not the large uh, output neurons in layer five, uh, but these are uh, pyramidal neurons just above that. So each of these electrodes, and this is to scale, can record from one or many of these neurons. And uh, as you might imagine, we can then, uh, because we have 100 electrodes active, we can record from a large number of neurons uh, to be able to read out the activity in a particular region of the brain with behavior. There's a pedestal that mounts on the skull. Uh, this is uh, titanium. And then on top of the pedestal, screws 
a, a preamplifier box that takes those signals, amplifies them, and then sends them out to the computer where they're digitized and we can use them like any other sort of data. And so this is a spike panel, a representative spike panel from actually from one of our participants, participant T5, who has two elect of these electrode arrays uh, implanted in the, uh, the uh, USRI's hand knob area of the motor cortex, which is uh, a familiar landmark for many neurosurgeons. So if we look at this array, we can sort of choose one channel and look and see what happens uh, under various different kinds of behavior. And so uh, if we uh, if we, if, if we ask a participant or a monkey in this case to move towards a, a, a target on the screen, what we see is that these uh, neurons are tuned. So what you see here is a, a, uh, uh, an experiment being done with a rhesus macaque where a target is presented on the screen. There's a go cue where he has to move to each of these individual targets. And then looking at the, uh, at the recording activity in that area of the brain, each of these, these are rasters, so each of these lines is a, is a trial, each of these little uh, dots is a spike, and what we see is that with leftward movement, this neuron uh, responds very briskly, but with rightward movement, it responds not so well. And it, it's interesting that this exhibits what we call cosine tuning, where uh, as you get further and further away from the preferred direction, your uh, your responses tail off in a, uh, in a nearly linear fashion. This was first described in 1986 by Georgopoulos and colleagues. So we can take this and say, okay, this particular neuron, we can label it as a leftward neuron. And if we look at all of the, uh, if, we, if we take a look at all of the neurons in our field, one might expect because they're in a very small area, this array covers four by four millimeters. So you would think they would have probably all be tuned in approximately the same way, but this turns out not to be the case. In fact, adjacent neurons can be tuned from very different reach directions. And so by looking at the activity across the entire ensemble, uh, we, uh, we can uh, decode what the intention is. So if we present, a, let's say, a target up and to the left, those neurons that are tuned for upward leftward movement will increase their firing rate and the others will decrease their firing rate. So that allows us to, to uh, pretty accurately decode the uh, the intended movement that the, the monkey, or in our case, the, the human research participant is, uh, is trying to make. And so uh, this, the, this translational step going from the monkey lab, Krishna Shinoy, again, I, who I mentioned is my, my, uh, my partner here, developed many of these uh, advanced techniques in, the, in his monkey lab. And then uh, these two uh, brilliant postdocs, Vakash Gilja and uh, Chetan Pandranath, uh, back in uh, circa 20, 2013, 2014, uh, developed an architecture to do this very rapidly and very accurately. So uh, here's just sort of the, the very broad overview. I could take each of these steps and break it down into about 50 more, uh, which I won't do, but I'm happy to do later if people are interested. Uh, we take those neural signals, we run them through decoder algorithms and filters. Uh, we then get a cursor velocity and a click signal, and we send that out to a behavioral display. And so what you'll see next is our participant, this, this woman who uh, uh, has ALS, and uh, she's going to be moving a cursor on the screen by thinking about it. So by thinking about moving her arm, she's moving this cursor. So we presented her here with an optimized keyboard and asked her to use the BCI to move this cursor from letter to letter to type out a response. We were asking her, how did you encourage your, your sons to practice music? She's a musician. Uh, before she contracted ALS, she used to make violins and violas. Uh, extremely talented programmer, just incredible polymath. And so she was a very enthusiastic partner with us in the research. You can see, you know, here's the preamplifier box, which is, uh, tr again, transcutaneous. And so she's just free will, free pace, typing out a message. And along the bottom, what you'll see is a sort of running total of what her correct characters per minute is. So she's she typing along and if she makes an error, she can go back to the delete key. Uh, we, this is a, an optimized keyboard that again, we took from the literature on, H, on human computer interaction uh, to try to uh, make it so that she could use this uh, in an optimized way. So this is a very natural interface for her to use. And you'll notice she's not moving. She's not moving anything. She's moving this uh, computer cursor uh, only with thinking about the, the concept of moving and the attempt to move. So the next question we asked is, well, could we take this and say, well, here's our existing system. 
but um, you know this this is all very custom designed. It's bespoke for one particular individual. It's you know very custom. W what if we took this and said, well, uh, we could send this off through Bluetooth or through Wi-Fi to to an, an Android interface, for example. And so, what we've done here is to take an off-the-shelf Android tablet and allow her to use her brain signals uh, as you would a mouse. So here she is. You, you can see she's on the left. Her tablet is way over on the right. And then in the middle, we're showing exactly what she's seeing on the screen as she moves this cursor around, pointing, clicking. She's a, she's a gardener, she loves flowers. And so she's just looking at uh, orchids, uh, looking at videos of orchid care. And so, as you might imagine, if you have someone who, who is in the end stages of ALS or is unable to move for whatever reason, uh, they can use this interface uh, to really restore a, a lot of the things that they used to be able to do with a computer. So um, this is a, a very nice figure uh, published by in, in JAMA by uh, Eddie Chang and Gopal uh, Anamach Pali in his lab. And this is just kind of an, uh, an idea of, of the spectrum of communication. So this is starting with some very simple interfaces like uh, BCI driven cursor control and uh, sip and puff interfaces. So people who uh, use very primitive in, uh, interfaces to control wheelchairs, et cetera. But we're here with our handwriting or with our, uh, with our 2D cursor control, but we could do better. So what about, for example, handwriting or other types of uh, interfaces? And so uh, we tried this and uh, published this in uh, just this year in Nature. And uh, so this is what that system looks like. So it's the same sort of interface with a Utah array and a decoder. This was done by, again, another brilliant postdoc in our lab, Frank Willett. And so uh, the question we asked is, do, does the neural representation of handwriting remain intact years after paralysis? So we can uh, use some fairly simple uh, algorithms to reconstruct the imagined pen tip trajectory. And it turns out that indeed we can surprisingly decode uh, as our participant is trying to, he, he imagines writing letters on a yellow legal pad. And so we're decoding this activity and we can, uh, we can read out uh, fairly legibly what he's writing. But we can also use uh, a recurrent neural network, artificial intelligence technology. Uh, again, this is work that Frank did in our lab uh, to determine the probability of any individual letter being typed. And I'm, uh, two to time, I'm gonna have to run through this very quickly, but I'm happy to talk about any details afterwards. Uh, and, uh, and then the output from this uh, gated recurrent unit, uh, RNN, gives us a raw output, which in this case you can see is T, N, E, N being uh, miscoded because H and N look a lot alike. And the raw output is actually pretty good, but we can do even better by using a language model that uh, has a series of probabilities that of what next letter should occur based on uh, what, word, uh, uh, what, what word the participant is probably trying to type. And, uh, and so the performance of this is actually pretty good. So we, we did this on five consecutive days with our participant and his performance uh, improved from about 60 characters per minute all the way up to uh, close to hundred uh, characters per minute, which is much better than the previous uh, uh, performance that we got. And by incorporating this language model, we could take our raw errors from anywhere between, you know, a couple of percentage points up to a, maybe 12 percent down to pretty down to single digits and in, on some days uh, actually down to zero. So this really does uh, provide a reliable interface. And so this is just kind of a, a, a comparison of the state of the art. So on the on the bottom, what you see is that point and click BCI, which we demonstrated in the prior um, you know, in the prior slide, this is using a regular QWERTY keyboard. And uh, this is the same participant doing these two uh, experiments about three years apart. On the bottom, he's achieving about eight words per minute. And on the top, uh, with handwriting, he's achieving about 17 words per minute. So this is a more than, again, a more than two times increase in the ability uh, for somebody to communicate. So, I mean, this is really, uh, really quite intuitive for him and really easy for him to communicate. So again, you could imagine somebody who had no ability could, to move could, could do this. And then and this is just, uh, so this is him using the system in real time. You can see he has two, uh, two pedestals. He has two arrays implanted. This is, uh, we do all these, uh, these sessions in our participants' place of residence. And so here he is again, just uh, free paste. Uh, well, th in this one, he's doing a, a copy typing task, but he can also do free paste. Uh, typing. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with this book, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, as by uh, Jean-Dominique Bobby, who was the um, 
editor in chief of Elle magazine and uh, suffered a brainstem stroke, which left him paralyzed except for the ability to move one eye. So he wrote this entire book by it, by having a, an assistant scan across a letter board and indicating with an upward movement of, of his eye uh, when he wanted to when he wanted to write a letter. So I'd recommend for anybody who hasn't read this, this is an absolutely beautiful book, and I, I recommend it. So, you know, continuing on, you know, what's the next frontier? Well, uh, on towards speech, you know, because although we're doing a pretty good job with handwriting, it would be great to be able to, to get to the fast level that people uh, speak. And so uh, why would we do this? Well, it's a, a, an exquisite motor control problem to study, but there's also a great translational need for, uh, for speech BMIs for patients who can't speak. And again, this is work done by a number of people in the lab based on really pioneering work uh, by Eddie Chang and colleagues up at UCSF. So this is our participant doing that task. You know, we've asked him to uh, say some words and, and sentences. Uh, we record from his brain. So these are those arrays on his uh, motor cortex. Uh, and we uh, again, record over across the entire array. And we can look at how individual neurons might be tuned to phonemes. And it turns out that this array in the hand area of the motor cortex actually is tuned to different types of syllables, which is pretty remarkable, actually. We didn't expect it. And so uh, here's a, a single neuron. You can see there are varying responses depending on what he's trying to speak. And we can do that with a second neuron and look at responses to, to oral facial movements, but it, which we would maybe expect, but, but the fact that, it, that these neurons respond uh, to particularly speech-related activity is pretty remarkable. And, uh, and so we went one step further by trying to decode a single trial neural activity, uh, sampling 420 different words and all English phonemes, and we're able to achieve about a 29% accuracy across all 39 phonemes. Now, keep in mind, this is from the wrong area of the brain. So we're not even recording from speech-related areas, including uh, uh, ventral precentral gyrus and inferior frontal gyrus and those areas that are, that are heavily involved in speech. So we're, we, we believe that this gives a very strong signal that uh, we should be able to implant those areas of the brain safely and, uh, and, and to be able to decode from them. Uh, and of course, our next steps would be to, to try to do this with continuous speech decoding. So I think we're out of time. So uh, I'll wrap up by saying, uh, I, five years ago, I wouldn't have really predicted we'd be as far as, we've, as we are now. And uh, I think we're getting really close to having some of these systems deployable and, and, and clinical and uh, really becoming clinical reality. But the other exciting thing is that uh, this BCI research enables incredible insights into fundamental human neuroscience, which we're really excited about. And uh, very soon we'll have systems that can provide real help for people with communication disorders and paralysis. So I'm very excited about the future and thanks for inviting me to talk. Uh, you know, hopefully at the end, we'll have some time for questions. And of course, this is the, the most important slide of the entire talk. Uh, this is all the people who made it possible. Uh, Frank Willett, Daryl Deo, Nichelle Shaw, Donald Evansino, Guy uh, Wilson, uh, Aaron Kunz, and uh, Chao Fei Fan. So these are, our, these are my lab and a, an incredible group of people they are. So uh, with that, I will stop and uh, release my, my screen. Thank you so much. What a what a fantastic and motivating talk, uh, Dr. Anderson. We really appreciate that. Uh, yes, we should have time at the end. Uh, next is Dr. Eric Lukart from uh, uh, Neurolutions, who's a chief scientific officer, and he's a neurosurgeon at, at Washington University. Eric, you want to take it over? Yeah, please. Let's see here. All right. Well, again, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. Um, oh, hold on for just a moment. Let me just correct this real fast. Um, again, it's uh, it's it's fun to kind of you know talk with you know other leaders in the field of brain computer interfaces. And as we were saying earlier, sometimes we don't get to see each other personally anymore because of uh, uh, travel restrictions. So anyway, it's really nice to see everyone. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work I've been involved with with Neurolutions uh, and where, where we're creating a brain computer interface solution for stroke. Uh, let me start with my disclosures. You know, I do own stock in Neurolutions. I was one of the founders and inventors of the technology involved with a number of other companies, uh, which are not uh, pertinent to this, uh, uh, to this presentation. 
And really, you know, when we think about stroke, it really is, you know, in addition to being one of the top causes of death, it's re it really is the leading cause of di disability in the United States, uh, in part because it really affects, you know, kind of people across a broad age spectrum. And, uh, and those people who do suffer from a stroke can live for a longer period of time with that disability. Um, when we think about just the numbers, uh, again, the annual incidence of stroke is around a million per year. And really one of the most common uh, persistent deficits is a chronic monoparesis, most, most notably the hand. And so and I think that when we think about stroke, that I think extraordinary work has been done in the early phases of stroke, uh, whether it be with TPA, whether it be with, I think, the superb work that's been done with uh, um, uh, clot retrievals, uh, so that there can be a substantial degree of intervention. But there are still a notable you know, cohort of patients who are left with a deficit. And that's where I think, you know, after six months where there's very little uh, uh, interventions possible, that this is really an opportunity zone for how we can intervene and alter uh, the, the course of these patients. And so, you know, historically, the current dogma, you know, of kind of brain and movement was that one side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body. So that, again, we as neurosurgeons know that, you know, when somebody suffers a stroke, that opposite side is, you know, typically affected. Now, I think one of the interesting things that, you know, we came to discover was that, you know, that if you ask a patient who has stroke, um, you know, they can still imagine moving, they still can try it, they can still try to move, they just can't actually move, the execution is gone. And one of the things that, um, you know, we discovered was that, uh, uh, th that, that, mo that the intentions uh, to move that affected limb are still preserved on the unaffected hemisphere, ipsilateral motor intentions. And that's where we thought that you know, a brain computer interface could be really a great opportunity to um, intervene. Now, historically, and again, and as I think uh, and Jamie highlighted this uh, really nicely, is that again, a brain computer interface has three parts, sensors, computation, and output, right? Now, you're taking some type of signal from the brain, you're analyzing that signal, digitizing it, and converting that into some type of control feature. And again, in the beginning, when we first started this work, people thought that the brain had to be intact for a brain computer interface to work. And we really set out to challenge that notion. Um, and where we really began was in epilepsy patients who were motor intact, where we basically had them uh, kind of do very specific motor tasks when they had electrode arrays over their brain. So, and specifically, these are called center out tasks. Uh, um, and this is just one example, of one of the studies that we produced is that uh, kind of when people reach in the center and they go and point to some distal target in this kind of, you know, in this cube. And one of the things we found was that basically, this is kind of a, that's kind of busy, but basically the movement directions, the movement speed, or we could reliably decode those from one hemisphere for both limbs. And so kind of what that told us was that motor kinematics and motor information was robustly bihemispherically uh, represented. And so then we took that information, we actually tested it out in stroke patients, because one of the things we also found was that the physiology associated with ipsilateral movements it had a kind of a low frequency shift. And as it turned out, we could pick that up non-invasively with an EEG headset. And so that led us to creating this idea of the ipsy hand. Again, a brain computer of ACE has three parts, sensors, right? Electrodes on the scalp, computation, a wearable uh, uh, exoskeleton that did all the, the signal processing and output, something that opened and closed the hand when the person thought about using it or thought about moving their limb. And so the idea was that if they continue to use it, could we recover hand function in a, in a rehabilitation role in chronic stroke? I'm just gonna show you kind of a, a little video kind of highlighting that notion. So if we get this to start. And again, this idea that uh, again, uh, primary motor cortex in blue, uh, uh, premotor in green, and we all, everybody in the audience here knows, you know, how, how it typically works. That again, signals are sent uh, uh, contralaterally down the spinal cord to, uh, to the limb to move muscles. And when that, that area is injured with stroke or trauma or hemorrhage, that uh, those execution signals are lost. Now, the, as, we, as I kind of showed you quickly, was that some of those signals are still preserved on the opposite hemisphere. And notably, they, they look to be more premotor in nature. 
And, um, and the thinking was, if we could pick up those signals, at, you know, with a wearable headset, and hopefully the, the video will continue to march on here, is, uh, and that, so that with the wearable headset connected to a robotic exoskeleton, that when those intentions to move are detected, that uh, those signals are then conveyed to the paralyzed limb. Importantly, that feedback, that precise timing, that when the intent is detected and it's converted to a motor movement, that that leads to proprioceptive feedback, that you're creating a closed loop Hebbian scenario that allows that, uh, that what was originally a planning portion of the brain to become an execution por portion of the brain. So that that area essentially takes over function of the paralyzed limb and the person doesn't need the system anymore. And so uh, we, and here's kind of what the system looks like today. Uh, here's kind of the sense, the wearable sensors, the computation, the wearable exoskeleton, and the output, which is that robotic exoskeleton. And there's a tablet in front of them that walks the patient through how to use this system. And so basically for the patient experience, uh, the, the, and the system was entirely designed so that somebody with a paretic limb could don and doff it with one hand. And that was really important. So this is a system that is completely home-based. And I think that's another important issue is that, you know, the patients get screened, they're deemed candidates, and then they get sent home and they do this all by themselves. Um, basically the patient wears the orthosis, can move their hand and arm. We have kind of this tablet that I mentioned that kind of walks them through and gives them visual feedback on their performance. Uh, um, and then the EEG text and instructs the orthosis to complete the motion. They do that for an hour a day, five days a week for 12 weeks. And so again, here's just an example of one of the patients. Uh, this is Rick, one actually one of the early patients who used this system. Here's, he's four years out from a stroke. Here you're going to see him doing what's called an action research arm test, where he has to pick up different objects and put them on top of the cabinet. And here he's uh, trying to pick up this marble. And again, it's not too hard to kind of realize that he's having a lot of trouble picking up that marble. Um, and I got to know Rick pretty well, actually. He's, you know, he was a fireman and he was a, kind of really a rigorously independent guy. Um, so, you know, he was really functionally disabled with this stroke. So now here he is four weeks after using the Ipsy hand, and you're going to see him trying to go after that marble again. And you can see it's by no means perfect, but he can now, you know, kind of functionally improve that hand. And, you know, at the end of it, you know, he told me something, he's, you know, he said, Dr. I just want to let you know, I can put my pants on again. And it's these type of key functional things that we're seeing improvements in for our patients that are really translating to uh, really meaningful clinical improvements. And so we've completed a number of clinical studies at this juncture. Um, and one of the things that we, you know, kind of is important are these various metrics, uh, such as the Fugelmeyer, you know, evaluation of upper extremity function, or the arm mobility, arm motor ability test, or the action research arm test. All of these studies have what are called kind of an MCID, basically minimally cl clinically important difference. And, and this is in chronic stroke. And so these kind of, you know, kind of scales of improvement are considered really important differences that'll translate to functional clinical improvements to the patient's lives. And these have been standardized. And, uh, um, you know, the, the, the patients in all have uh, sh had, had improvements that have been beyond MCID, which is really critically important. And importantly, you know, a number of people may ask, well, after those three months of use, do they continue to maintain those gains? And as it turns out, they do. For we've got a number of patients now who we've got, you know, you know, as far out as, you know, six months, and they're also maintaining those improvements that they have in motor function. And as far as, you know, again, I've shown functional results, but we've also, you know, really starting to dive deeply into the mechanism. I'll go through this kind of quickly, but one of the things we look at is brain networks before and after uh, uh, using the system as measured by resting state functional MRI. And we looked at a cohort of patients and compared them to kind of a, a group of patients doing intensive physical therapy. And here's the group, you know, who all showed uh, substantial improvement. We looked at their resting state networks, how their networks change across their motor network. And I think one of the key differences that we saw was that, um, again, the, 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 the network connectivity metrics for the 
stroke patients, you know, who had were pre BCI therapy versus the stroke patients who were pre physical therapy were pretty much the same. Uh, but the connectivity changes between BCI therapy versus uh, physical therapy were strikingly different. We saw modifications across both, you know, hemispheres. Uh, um, actually saw a decrease in connectivity. And importantly, that decrease in connectivity in critical areas was very tightly correlated to the functional improvement with it that we saw. And I think the, the bottom line here is that the use of the brain computer interface system is indeed changing brain network and brain network organization. And this is correlating to recovery. Similarly, we looked at EEG and we looked at a, a kind of a very specific feature of EEG called phase amplitude coupling, which is thought to be related to memory and, uh, and consolidation of information. And we hypothesized that phase amplitude coupling would change with, you know, with uh, motor learning. And indeed it did. And that's specifically theta gamma coupling. And again, that this was primarily localized to motor and importantly, pre-motor areas that we hypothesized uh, in the unaffected hemisphere. And that these uh, this phase amplitude coupling measures tightly correlated also with improvements in the upper extremity Fugelmeyer metrics and the AMAT metrics, which are functional measures of, of uh, strength and movement. So, you know, I'm excited to say that this, you know, the system that we created, you know, again, it, it was been developed and advanced by the company that I started, Neurolutions, that did receive a breakthrough designation by the FDA, as well as F FDA authorization uh, back in April of this year. Also, you know, just recently, it was awarded the product of the year award by the California Life Sciences as the, the top medical device or diagnostic of the year. So I think what's really cool about this technology is it's not a drug. It's not a surgery. It really just is a fundamental BCI tool that, that uh, kind of capitalizes on the timing of the brain and correctly aligning signals to achieve a, a functional change in network organization. That's clinically important. So again, to summarize, uh, I think this is the first brain control, brain computer interface controlled therapy. It's been FDA cleared, been given a breakthrough designation and named product of the year. It's been clinically validated. It does modify motor networks and it does change baseline physiology in stroke patients. So with that, I think I'm also at time and I look forward to talking about it more. Thank you very much. And also I wanna thank the many people who've worked on this specifically, some of my faculty uh, uh, collaborators, Alex Carter, Dan Moran and T Husky. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Luthard. This is Heather with the Subcortical Surgery Group. And while Dr. Bales jumps back on here, um, we do have a question for you from Dr. Henderson himself. He was wondering, sorry. Yeah, no, um, I'm, I'm ha actually happy to ask it myself. Great oh, work. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, great work, Eric. I, uh, I wondered if, uh, I, I didn't know if we were holding questions to the end, but um, uh, yeah, did you compare the Ipsy hand to uh, best, uh, the usual rehab yeah, management? Yes, yeah, yeah, so we've compared it to that to physical therapy and also done a meta-analysis of all the control groups across, I think like, you know, I think something like 36 studies, you know, where basically standard physical therapy has been done. Basically, if you look at, uh, um, you know, physical therapy and chronic stroke, the best, you know, uh, 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 Fugelmeyer, upper extremity Fugelmeyer improvement you get is around 0.82. We get around 5.6 to 7 uh, in our groups. So we, we kind of are an order of magnitude better than, uh, than how kind of standard therapy achieves. And that's why we got the FDA breakthrough designation. Mm -hmm. Is Could that be, I mean, it sounds like it's, it may even partially be due to motivation. If the patients have it at home, they can use it themselves. You know, it's something that they can do more of if they want to. So you think that? Uh, might be well, no, it? actually. So uh, certainly there is motivation there, um, but the improvement is linearly correlated to the degree to which they improve their brain computer interface control. So the better their control, the better they achieve their motor function. So it is directly and tightly coupled to BCI control. Cool. Very promising. Thanks. Yep. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, now we'll go ahead and move on to Dr. Mako. And you're muted, by the way. How's that? Can you hear me okay? 
better. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank Wonderful. you. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> well, I'll start with man, that's inspiring. I mean, you guys, is there it, to to hear those things, and particularly the little things like helping him put on his pants, uh, you know, button that you said, Eric, uh, separate from picking up a marble. I think it's important for people to realize that and realize how uh, there can be tremendous improvements in people's quality of life with the application of these technologies, which is very exciting. So I'm going to talk a slightly different way and, and probably the least subcortical of the group here, <laughs> um, where we're pursuing doing brain computer interface through a transvascular route. Um, which I, I think is pretty exciting. Although certainly as the technology evolves, there may be access to subcortical structures through, um, through the vasculature, which, which obviously goes everywhere. Um, let me just get, here we go. So here are my disclosures. And in particular, I'd like to highlight that I, I do have stock and I'm an investor in the company Synchron, which is the data I'm gonna uh, present today and, and the technology uh, that we're uh, gonna share. It originally developed um, out at uh, University of Melbourne and um, has now moved to uh, this independent company, uh, which is based in the US. Um, and then the other disclosure I think is important, I like to put up front rather than the back, and certainly this isn't everyone, but it, but it's a number of the key players. Uh, this is the work of a team, uh, a broad team that's part of this. Uh, you know, I'm actually not a particularly brain computer interface expert. And, um, I, I feel a little embarrassed to be standing amongst these giants on this uh, collection of talks, uh, but I, I bring expertise in terms of the transvascular approaches and routes. Um, but really, uh, some of the leads here, Tom Oxley, who's the uh, CEO of Synchron, and also is my partner and a faculty member here at Mount Sinai, um, Nick Opie, uh, who is the chief uh, technical officer, and Peter Yu, who's the director of neuroscience. Um, they're all Australian, and, and uh, a number of them recently relocated to New York um, to do that. But they also uh, take very uh, impressive uh, photos. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll talk about this transvascular approach to uh, brain-computer interface um, for patients with severe paralysis. And as has already been highlighted, there are over 5 million people in the U.S. living with paralysis, uh, whether from stroke or from any number of other uh, disease states that create that kind of an environment. Um, and so uh, motor neuron prosthesis is the ability to create the ability uh, to interact with the outside world uh, is going to be a crucial technology for us to develop. Um, as was sort of previously highlighted, you normally have your brain, it sends signals to your muscles or feet, which then interact with the outside, either picking up a marble or clicking a mouse button. Um, which then interacts with digital devices. If you've had uh, paralysis like Christopher Reeves from falling off a horse, or you've developed ALS, or you've had a brainstem stroke, uh, there's all these different conditions that will interfere in the pathway of you sending that information out to engage with um, outside technology. Uh, and so the question is, is can we develop a motor neuron prosthesis, a thing that will take that signal from your brain and bring it out to the outside electronic technologies? And as, as you guys have already seen, there's been a lot of work done in this direction. Um, you saw two really amazing examples from the prior speakers. Um, in particular, we're interested in um, ECOG, electrocorticography, and its ability to discern meaningful signals to send out information. Uh, there was a landmark paper published out of the, by the Danish group in 2016 where they had a fully implantable system. It was with a craniotomy, um, but it was able to... Uh, pick up electrocorticography signals, and then transmit those at one character per 52 seconds with about a 90% selection accuracy. Uh, this allowed a complete independent use of intracortical uh, brain-computer interface, which was a pretty big step. And then uh, was highlighted by Dr. Henderson, uh, uh, Eddie Chang and his group has done a lot of amazing work, the most recent of which was published in New England Journal uh, just a few months ago which uh, showed a percutaneous system. Um, this did go through, through uh, the skin and, and had a, a more typical uh, setup that was a little less uh, practical for use. However, in looking at high gamma band um, features of electrocorticography, they were able to, in, couple, in, in uh, connection and use with uh, AI and uh, language modeling um, and word prediction, generate uh, 12 and a half correct words per minute um, essentially someone could think and generate sentences and, and writing. 
And so what is the technology that we're pursuing in this context with, um, with Synchron? And what that is, is basically an endovascular electrophotography system. Essentially what happens is we take a, a electrode array and go transvenous and deploy it in the sagittal sinus. This allows us to pick up signal from the motor and premotor areas, um, much as just were highlighted uh, through, a, uh, through an external system uh, by Dr. Luthard. And so this instead is placed in the sinus. Um, it migrates into the wall. We have uh, publications demonstrating uh, how that works. So it becomes endothelialized into the vessel and moves out towards the appetitia. In effect, over time, the signal improves uh, in terms of the quality of the signal. And then that uh, has a wire that goes down through the jugular and then goes to a subcutaneous uh, wireless tel telemetry unit, which goes in the subclavicular pocket. This can then connect to a Bluetooth signal and interface with any digital output that we'd like. Uh, the first in human case uh, cases were presented in the Journal of Neurodimensional Surgery uh, just this past year, and the complete trial, which I'm going to present the early results for, has been completed and uh, is being worked up. Here's some images to sort of highlight what happens. We use a functional MRI to make sure we're identifying the right areas of the neuroanatomy, uh, target those areas and do co-registration intraprocedurally so that we can see exactly where we're placing the uh, trans um, sagittal sinus uh, stentrode, the, the electrode array adjacent to those structures. You'll see here's a video of the deployment of the electrode array into the sagittal sinus. You'll see you, you just unsheath it and it sort of generally comes out. And then here's a 3D showing the wire coming down, going down through the transverse sigmoid sinuses to the uh, array. Uh, we then connect that to the uh, telemetry unit, which is pocketed in the subclavicular pocket. So the SWITCH study, which was a stentrode with thought controlled digital SWITCH trial, which was performed in Australia, uh, recently completed. It was approved for up to five patients with 12 month following. It's a primary outcome was safety to ensure that we were not seeing treatment related adverse events. We weren't getting sinus thrombosis or other complications, but we also uh, wanted to see that we could get high fidelity, stable signals. And here's the first human being, uh, the patient has ALS. Uh, you can see he's at home, he has no percutaneous, uh, everything is completely uh, contained within his body. It's very easy for him to use it. And he can simply engage with his laptop at home, uh, which really revolutionized uh, the quality of his life. And I'll sort of point that out in a second. Um, here's a, a, another patient who is using the technology to type. Now in this context that you're seeing here, he's using it uh, with eye tracking, but rather than having a two minute lag or two second lag for clicking the yes or no for the words he's typing, he's able to think for click and then that click is able to happen in a much more rapid fashion. Uh, and then here's the first patient I showed you before. Uh, he was quite hypophonic from his ALS and his wife essentially needed to be in the same room as him for him to be able to interact. And using this technology is why I was strike about the simple little things that make a difference. He was able to use WhatsApp now. He couldn't tolerate using the eye tracking software before he felt it was too frustrating and too slow. Now he could do it with uh, WhatsApp and his wife was able to leave the house, go to other areas and he could easily access her. And he reported this as a tremendous improvement in his quality of life, uh, which made a huge difference. So here are the results. The primary result, as I told you, was safety. Uh, four patients were implanted. One patient had um, a completely absent uh, unilateral si sinus on one side in the transverse sinus. And, uh, according to our initial first in man experiences, we felt that we should exclude patients like that to be safe. Although given the results of the study, I think we'll probably open those patients up for future treatment. Uh, three of the patients have completed their 12 months and one patient uh, has one month to go. But you can see that there were no uh, adverse events, no stroke, no thrombosis, no bleeding or, or any other or SAEs. Uh, there was a little bit of mild headache and some bruising where they put the, made the pocket. But for those of us that have put it in DB, DBS uh, pockets before, that, that can happen. Um, we were able to get excellent signal fidelity um, in the current iteration that was used in this trial. We had 12 uh, electrodes uh, where we could get high degrees of, uh, of high quality information. What was probably most striking was the extreme lack of effort, the intuitiveness of using the technology. Um, we, we spent a while working out the kinks with the very first patient, but after that, basically at the first session, we could get the patients to use the technology. And within uh, one to three days, of, one to four days of 
first using the technology, the patients were able to independently use the technology at home uh, to improve their quality of life and their ability to interact with digital devices, which they felt was important. We're also improving the ways in which we assess things. Here's a situation, so to divorce ourselves from eye tracking, um, this is a, a radio sort of clock rotation. And when the ball gets to a certain point, you can click to cause the ball to move in that direction and you can essentially put the ball into the hole. And this is something uh, that we've been getting a great deal of improved success with. We've also learned important lessons. Um, for instance, there may be a, a laterality to the confounding effects of the heart electrical activity uh, and placing the uh, generator on the right side may have some benefit. Um, and so we're now pursuing the command trial. Uh, we have FDA approval for a US early feasibility trial um, and uh, NIH grant to support this, uh, which is going to be performed at Mount Sinai, UPMC and Carnegie Mellon. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you and try to leave a few minutes for questions if possible. Thank you, Dr. Moko. Fascinating work. Congratulations on the really innovative approach and, uh, and uh, minimally invasive access without a craniotomy. Uh, thank, thank all of our three panelists for their great presentations, uh, Dr. Luthor, Dr. Henderson, and Dr. Moko. Uh, we do have a few minutes left for Q&A. And I, I think one really good way to start off would be to hear each of our panelists uh, describe what they believe the biggest impediments are for what they've tried to do so far. And, and certainly going forward, is that things such as insurance? Is it, uh, is it technical problems? Is it that uh, we don't really have the right uh, equipment and electronics that we need? So maybe I'll start uh, with Dr. Henderson first and we'll take it in order to consider the, some of those aspects. Sure. Um, you know, this is uh, we uh, in our trial, there is no benefit uh, to the participants. So unlike uh, the technology that, uh, that Dr. Luthart and Dr. Moko uh, described, uh, this is very labor intensive to use these cortical implants. I mean, the, that's the trade off right now for high performance is that uh, it's very labor intensive. And so uh, it's very difficult to, to recruit uh, participants for the study. You know, people we can't offer them any particular benefit. They are really serving as test pilots and pioneers. And so uh, those are, in, in a way, those are great folks to have uh, on your team and they are real team members. So, you know, they, they uh, help us troubleshoot the systems. They suggest experiments to do. They tell us what they like and what they don't like. And they give us, you know, real insights into, you know, what the day-to-day -day life of somebody with paralysis is like. And we work with each of them for years on a, at a time. So our current participant, uh, whose uh, code name is T5 in the study, or his, his uh, you know, participant number is T5, has been with us now for over five years. So we've been recording from uh, five plus years from, from his uh, motor cortex and have, uh, he's, he's very proud to have been sort of featured on news stories and, you know, been, uh, you know, the, He's produced the data for these studies, so he's, he's very proud. But, but it's challenging to recruit people for a study like this. I think once we, uh, you know, once we have uh, better fully implantable systems, I mean, these things are coming, fully implantable, wireless. Uh, you know, I think there's some great things that you can do, uh, certainly with um, less invasive techniques, such as, um, you know, EEG or, you know, the, the Really innovative intravascular technique, but the but there's a trade-off because uh, you know in order to really get high bandwidth and high performance, I think we need to know exactly what the neurons are doing. We need to uh, listen to the whole ensemble, and uh, and 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 that's how we can really reproduce the types of natural movement that that people can make. Uh, there was another question on infections, and uh, you know, have there been any infections? So these, it's interesting over time. Uh, since they're percutaneous, there often gets to be a little bit of crusting or things around there. Uh, some of them have actually looked a little, you know, a little concerning, but if we, you know, give a week of antibiotics or something, they usually clear up and then they're fine again for a while. It, there's, there's a routine that we clean the pedestals routinely, uh, you know, at, at least several times a week. And, uh, and uh, 
you know, we keep a close eye on them. So, so far we haven't had to, implant, to explant any of our uh, now 11 participants in the study uh, due to an infection. So I think that's pretty, pretty encouraging safety record. So I'll, I'll turn it over to others to answer the question about uh, the barriers that everybody faced uh, in, their, in their quest. Can I go next? Uh, so I guess, you know, just thinking about having, you know, gone through the process of, you know, getting something approved, you know, I think that, again, uh, for me, you know, I, whether it's single units, ECOG, EEG, I think that, you know, each of these, you know, kind of, you know, platforms, you know, uh, uh, and there's actually many more beyond that, it's figuring out this right balance of, you know, risk to information needed to uh, uh, clinical need. And, and again, you're always kind of like, you know, I think toggling those to get, you know, kind of the, the right solution. Um, I, I'd say the barriers in my mind, you know, a big barrier, quite honestly, is the slow pace of finance, meaning whether you're applying for NIH grants or you're getting, you know, raising venture capital or, you know, it's a, it's a long, slow, you know, uh, process to just get that. Because again, if I, given infinite resources, I think a lot of these could be made clinically feasible, you know, in the near, very near future. I don't think there's technical barriers per se. I'd still say there's some scientific barriers, meaning that we need to really better understand how information is encoded in the brain and how we can modify brain networks and plasticity. There's more to learn. What we do know, I think we can use and we can use for clinical benefit. Um, and I'd say the, the other barriers are, you know, just hanging a tie, get ties to money is regulatory and development process, right? Like there's just a whole bunch of stuff that needs to go into kind of, you know, getting things from one step to the next. And that takes time and money. So those would be my thoughts. Yeah, I would only second what was just shared. I mean, or third it. Uh, it it's, it's a reality. There's a myriad of things that need to be balanced. Um, resources, uh, adequate capital, um, access to patients. Uh, it, you know, we, we're very lucky to live in a, a place and, and, and for the modern sort of developed world to have robust infrastructures for to protect uh, patients and, and have, you know, FDA and other things, but those things are also, you know, challenges. The, the process of going through putting in applications, working through concerns, I think in the end, you end up with a better product for it and, and uh, it forces us to learn in, in meaningful ways, but there's a lot to be done in the interconnectivity of uh, funding, technology, regulatory, uh, all the rest of it. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, effort and expertise to navigate and, and get through that. Um, that said, I agree. I think technologically we're there. We're in a position where, where uh, patients really can be helped greatly. Uh, in terms of the infection question that was brought up, uh, we don't have any issues with that. Um, we haven't seen anything along those lines. It's, you know, we're very lucky with the approach that we've taken that we're working within the vascular system, which is extremely resistant to infection, uh, much like, you know, heart pacemakers and other things it's it's there's just such a robust immune response that's something we haven't run into and hopefully won't okay no, another question a good question is uh how, how long does it take to decode the neural signals before there is some consistency in the functional output Sorry, yeah, it's uh, it, uh, the the questioner asked about Neuralink. Uh, I, I consult for Neuralink. They they don't yet have a have a device available, so I can't speak to it. But they do have a similar approach, which is to uh, you know try to record from ensembles of of cortical neurons. Uh, it, this is a really interesting question, and we ask this very specifically. So our most recent participant, uh, before we had him do any sort of BCI control whatsoever. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, you know, neurosurgery resident actually who was uh, uh, working in the laboratory at uh, MGH came up with a, a really brilliant idea. He said, well, let's test and see how long it takes for him to get control of a computer cursor if we, if we give him a, uh, you know, retrainable network, a network that's, or a, um, uh, an algorithm that's constantly looking at his intention and then trying to retrain in order to make his, uh, the, the neural activity he's producing match uh, what it is he's trying to achieve. And so the answer to the question about how long does it take uh, to get some consistency, it's about 60 seconds. And uh, it took him, within two minutes, he was controlling the cursor about as well as he would 
throughout most of the throughout most of the time. Now we can still, you know, make um, small adjustments, and you know, we there's lots of tweaks that we made that that improved the the uh, the performance. You know, so it's not to say that you know everything is done instantly, but but it's remarkable if you build good decoders uh, that match uh, what the participants trying to do, then uh, then it works pretty well. Uh, now. The other part of this question, though, is stability of the neural signals, and I think this is where, um, you know, ECOG. There's a trade-off between ECOG recording and intracortical recording. ECOG uh, is it averages together many, many neurons, and thus, you know, loses some of the resolution that you can get through intracortical. But the the signals tend to be a bit more stable. So here we see a lot of instability day to day and week to week, and this is really a big uh, push in terms of our fundamental research in the lab is to try to uh, ferret out what those sources of instability are so that we can try to correct them and understand them uh, to make better to build better interfaces so it's a it's a it's a pretty deep and interesting question uh, which we can only just sort of superficially address today so hopefully that answered the question uh, dr stephanie Plummer from australia who was, was a member of our team when we did our work uh, that i described ask, are there any preferences in terms of materials or, or metals or other components uh, that seem to be better tolerated, either functionality or to reduce infection and, and tolerated better? Yeah, and again, I think this is mainly, you know, for the implantable devices. Uh, so, uh, you know, Dr. Moko will let you answer too, but, I, but in terms of the intracortical interfaces, there've been a lot of different materials that have been investigated. And uh, many of those are very promising. I, probably the most promising are these um, uh, extremely fine uh, carbon monofilament fibers that uh, Cindy Chestick at the University of Michigan is, is looking at. They're, uh, they're extremely, they're tiny and very innocuous and they don't seem to generate any sort of an immune response. So they may end up being, if, if the challenges of, of actually connecting to those things can be met, may end up being an almost ideal sort of interface. Uh, but there are a number of uh, flexible substrate <clears throat> interfaces that are currently <clears throat> being looked at for chronic implants. The Utah arrays that we use, silicon-based uh, microelectrode arrays, uh, do produce uh, a histological response, <clears throat> and uh, uh, but it's actually reasonably well tolerated, uh, which is evidenced by the fact that we can get good recordings many years down the road. Yeah, for <clears throat> our implantable, you know, it's it's a bit easier, I think, to be honest for us. Uh, we don't have to deal with the same sort of immune reactions for those of us that have gone back and done craniotomy on patients that have had stents placed in their uh, intracranial vasculature. You can often see the stent. It's in the wall of the in admin tissue of the vessel. It doesn't incite a significant inf inflammatory or immune reaction. Uh, so we often have a very, in fact, we've shown this that the signal improves over time and stays quite strong and consistent. Uh, there are nuances, uh, you know, for us, it's metallurgy. Um, we have a, the current, the structure that's been used in people right now is nitinol based with uh, some nuances of microfilms and other things to try to improve signal. But we're not fighting the same battle with uh, the cellular reaction or responsiveness. And for me, we're fine. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Okay. Uh, one of our attendees asked this uh, really uh, probing question. What are the top two markets for BCI in the next five years? I, I think paral I think paralysis, I'll just throw that out there. I think paralysis as a whole, I think that it's important for the space to realize that paralysis isn't, I, I, I hope we don't head down the path where we have to do it for stroke and for ALS and for, um, you know, eight, eight other diseases that cause the same syndrome. It's, you know, when you think about pain modulation, um, people receive pain uh, uh, stimulators or pain modulators. Um, for whatever the source of their pain syndrome is. And I think being able to help with paralysis, be that be, be that motor, um, speech, uh, any of those contexts. I think we live in such a digital world that being able to turn thought into digital uh, signal um, will have tremendous effects, whatever the nature of the paralysis the patient suffers. I'd say from my perspective, it's stroke and uh, uh, mental health disorders. I think those two are the, the giants. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add it. It really depends on how you define BCI. So 
many of most of the, most of the stimulators and things that we implant now are our computers. So you could broadly define it as a, a neuropace device being a BCI. You know, it's reading signals, it's using algorithms to generate a response, and it's and it's doing that in a closed loop fashion. So, um, you know, I think there's a very broad waterfront for this technology, uh, and um, you know, I think we're. we're things are going to continue to advance in parallel you know as i resonated with something that eric said which is you know we really need to know more neuroscience in order to uh, to push the field forward and i think that's where uh, we're very fortunate uh, i think as a group of researchers to have access to these uh, you know really precious human um, uh, you know human neural data that will help us to really learn more about the brain Another question, for training on the algorithms, do you use a fresh set of data on each recording or are all previous recordings part of the training set? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one because it's a very, <laughs> this is another really great question, whoever asked it very deep. Uh, this is, we could have a whole session just on this in terms of, you know, what's the optimum thing to do. We have a lot of data on uh, the difference between and it really depends on the different types of decoders. So we use linear decoders like Kalman filters, uh, but also uh, recurrent neural networks that can exhibit nonlinear behavior. And um, you know, for RNNs, of course, they're very you know machine learning algorithms are very data hungry. So they need as much data as you can give them, including all the sessions you've done and all the sessions uh, and, and all the data from the day and whatever synthetic data you can generate if there's a principled way to do that. Uh, linear filters tend to work best on the on what on what was done that day, and um, I don't know. We don't have time to go into some of the details, but I could talk about our what's called refit, where we where we uh, start with a base algorithm and then uh, use patient specific data on the on the day of to train those algorithms. And again, that's part of the part of the price we pay for the intercortical work is it's um, more challenging to get those things the decoders built. But once they do, once you do, they're they can be very high performance. So I don't know if this, uh, you know, if there's a, uh, if you guys have answers in terms of training or training the algorithms or anything like that. No, I mean, we're, we're obviously working in very different sort of scales. Uh, I think you said something neat earlier about um, really paying attention to each member of the ensemble. Uh, and, and as you sort of alluded to before we're, we're just trying to listen to the whole orchestra all together <laughs> and whether you know they're they're the the beats fast or slow or or their uh forte or pianum so so it's uh it, it's a it's a very different way to approach it yeah and again i'm the funny thing is i'm kind of like i'm in my home i'm an ecog guy but you know basically as i've learned kind of you know how to kind of translate things you know i, I transitioned to eeg just to create the a solution for patients but uh, um but yeah i think eeg and ecog they have some uh, at least for our eeg patients it's it's pretty stable uh their their control is more rudimentary than some of the things we're showing but as they improve their control uh, um they uh, they use the same signals uh, re really interesting is there any way to dampen or filter out unwanted signals from nearby neurons that perhaps aren't, aren't part of the network that you're interested in? Uh, well, they're all informative, so we don't actually want to do that. We want, we want, we want all the information we can get. Uh, and interestingly, they're, uh, they do, uh, they do lots of different things. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's some work on this from uh, some of the folks who are in our lab and now independently, uh, really looking at how neurons that appear active at one stage of a movement, uh, for example, during execution, uh, may be silent, but they may be active uh, during planning and vice versa. So there, are, there's all sorts of interesting things happening in the in the neural populations that, you know, that as you study these things over years, you you learn more about them, and it's uh, it's a it's a very deep and interesting question. I, unfortunately, I don't think we probably have time to go into it in the depth. I'd love to be able to. Say that for another time. Here's a good question. Given the importance of these implants stems from its duality as a probe and a modulator of uh, neuronal activity, what do we think we have learned from the probes thus far and where do we aim to go from here? Is it, 
Is it, uh, is it motor? Is it uh, speech? Is it visual? Is it everything that we learn that we can make an impact upon? Or do you think for the next five years, we should focus on, on uh, two or three of these major components? Yeah, this is, this is actually uh, some great work done by the folks at University of Pittsburgh who are really leading the way there uh, in terms of uh, write-in. So implanting electrodes in sensory cortex and writing in sensory information. Uh, Charlene Flesher, who uh, uh, did her uh, a PhD at Pittsburgh and was a postdoc in my lab for a while. She's now at Apple, by the way. Um, she uh, she uh, was the first author on a, a nature paper on this very topic, which is uh, you know, really, really interesting uh, being able to, um, our nature medicine, being able to, um, you know, re restore better, uh, restore sensation to a, using it essentially a robotic limb. Uh, and, and, and when the participant would touch things, be able to transmit the, that uh, input data into the cortex so that they could actually feel things again and, and use that as a feedback mechanism. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely, uh, something that we should be looking to doing uh, into doing. I know that there's been work on cortical uh, prosthetics for uh, for re restoration of vision, and uh, I think the more the the uh, more the technology advances, uh, and this is really where I think subcortical comes in, like thalamic. If we can if we can uh, develop uh, deep electrode arrays that are very fine that could reach all the way down to thalamus, I think you could get some very exquisite. Uh, types of, of modulation in, in, the, in, in areas that are really specialized for it. Another question is, could it, anyone or all of you comment on the potential and the focus on, on uh, perhaps applications for pediatric patients? Uh, I mean, I'll... I'll I'll start, I guess. I, I don't, I mean, that's going to be a very interesting question. I, again, patients that are suffering from paralysis or other challenges or communication, certainly, uh, you know, closing that loop and going back into stimulation, we've seen uh, some pretty, pretty exciting results with the benefit of uh, RNS for pediatric epilepsy. Um, so I think there's, there's directions here, but it brings its own unique problems. Um, our system's great in that we don't um, have a, a, a percutaneous sort of exposure part and have to worry about that infection, but a pediatric patient's growing. And so the distance between their sagittal sinus and their subclavicular pocket will certainly change over time, uh, depending on when you're putting it in. So there, there certainly will be challenges to be thought of, uh, particularly in the context of a plastic mind. I wonder if Eric's work would be even more more impressive and responsive with a plastic child's brain. If, if yeah, you know, it's 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 not lost on us. <laughs> like you know, yeah. we, you know, just to be clear, we are only authorized for adults at this juncture. But it absolutely, like, I mean, there is pediatric stroke. You know, there is um, cerebral palsy. You know, I think that uh, again, you know, we we get excited about the possibility of you know kids. And now again, we have to reconfigure everything for kids' heads and shapes and sizes and hands and stuff like that. But uh, but I think that uh, that would be an exciting avenue to pursue in the future for sure. Another question, is it possible to simultaneously decode speech and movement from the same motor area via the same electrode array? Yeah, I love that question. Uh, uh, actually, it isn't, it isn't. And the reason for this is, uh, is actually uh, fairly subtle. We, uh, so I, I direct you to a paper from our lab that was published in Cell last year, uh, uh, which, uh, shows that there's sort of a compositional coding that occurs where, you know, we, it, we found that, that electrodes in this area of the brain, uh, it, which we think is analogous to not, to not to primary motor cortex, which is on the bank of the central sulcus, but actually to premotor cortex. So this, this, the precentral, the crown of the precentral gyrus in people behaves more like dorsal premotor cortex does in non-human primates rather than primary motor cortex in non-human primates. So, so uh, there's higher level information here. And it turns out that uh, this part of the brain, this, the hand knob uh, responds to everything, to hand movement, to leg movement, to face, arm, or to face, to neck, uh, to speech. And, uh, but 
the upper extremity is still most strongly represented. And there's uh, actually suppression of those weaker signals when you're using it as a primary effector. Uh, but but uh, th there's been work now being done by Daryl Deo in our lab, looking at simultaneous control of two effectors, which he's getting to work pretty well. And uh, it's possible that we might be able to, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can do a really good job of decoding hands, feet, and, and other things. So one could even think about with a very small implant doing something like controlling an exoskeleton. Uh, but, but there is this challenge of the suppression of, of other signals that we have to deal with. So yeah, Cell, cell 2020, um, uh, Willett, and, Willett and Deo are the two authors, the two lead authors. So from our ECOG experience, you know, both in primates and humans, I think it's actually pretty surprising how widely information is represented in cortex. You know, I think every time, you know, whether it be language or, you know, motor function, you know, whether it be bihemispheric representation, movement kinematics, or language distribution, that's really much broader than I think people kind of, then we as neurosurgeons give it credit for, like with our kind of localiza localizing, you know, kind of, um, efforts when we do, you know, mapping and stuff like that, but actual information representation, I find to be quite broad. Yeah, I, I would, I guess I just second that when you're, when you're capturing, when you're capturing the whole orchestra, then the key is, can you hear different orchestras with the background of the city noise, you know, and, and that's what we're, that's the, the key is there, there, there's, there's broad signal patterns that exist. Um, but how do you work that out? Uh, from a signal to noise perspective. In regards to training algorithms, are they generalizable from one patient to another? Yeah, this is actually, uh, Nishal Shah in our lab is really, really interested in this question. I mean, could you build a universal decoder? Uh, and you know, his, his, his graduate work uh, before he joined our lab was in, in the retina and looking at homologies between different retinas and different uh, non-human primates. So it turns out there are some homologies at, at the retinal level. I would be shocked if those homologies existed in the human cortex. Uh, given the number of cells, given the, the variability of the location of the arrays that we have placed in our different participants, which are constrained anatomically, you know, depending on you know, being in just the right spot where you miss all the blood vessels. And, and so we have to compromise often a little bit. Uh, and just how differently things could be represented in the brains of two different people. So that being said, you know, Nishal, uh, this is back burner because he's doing some more practical things right now, but it's been a burning question of interest for him. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, he, he's got some thoughts on this, but uh, we write currently, we currently only have two participants in the trial. We should soon have more. And so we'll try to be able to get more data to, to, to see if, if RNNs might be able to find some generalizable patterns in these data that we just haven't been able to come across yet. Given the, the current model of how we believe that the movement is encoded, is motor cortex, whether you're going intravascular or onlay with a, a surface electrode, is motor cortex the ideal location for most implants? Uh, as we have seen in our, in our patients who have premotor lesions, how important the premotor cortex is to, to uh, movement. And it, uh, I've been amazed through the years sometimes how that's been so critical more than maybe I, I realized anyway in the past. So is motor cortex the best location? Depends on the indication. Of what you're doing. Or? I, I think it really depends on what, you know, I think you have to get very concrete here. Like when, as we think about location of implant, and, you know, what's the, what's the best location, but also what's the best form factor? What's the best, you know, what's the clinical need and what kind of information you're trying to get? It's really triangulating. I don't think there's any best, right? I think there's, you know, kind of what is the optimal solution for a, a problem that you have clinically. And, uh, um, and I think there's many form factors. Uh, and again, it's, I think it's really dialing that into kind of the appropriate uh, patient because, you know, uh, um, I think, you know, the work that Jamie is doing is beautiful work with, uh, you know, kind of high fidelity information, but is that, you know, for instance, is that a consumer product? No, it's not, you know, uh, but that may be really appropriate for you know, a significantly impaired motor impaired communication impaired patients. Uh, um, but, you know, is that, is that solution perhaps ideal for somebody who can talk and, you know, maybe move, you know, and needs to, you know, has, you know, some communication abilities, 
maybe not, right? Like maybe, you know, it's a, maybe that is the, the, the intravascular approach and, or maybe somebody has got, you know, a motor disability and, uh, and they, maybe an EEG is a rehabilitation tool. I think they all kind of fit together in concert along a spectrum of, of, you know, needs. And so that's why, again, I, I really, you know, I think it's important to divorce ourselves from saying what is best, right? Like uh, I think it becomes kind of, I think much more select than that is, is my kind of strong opinion. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, Eric. I think, you know, from a clinical standpoint, absolutely. I think, you know, from, uh, from the perspective of the sort of work that my lab does, which is to try to push performance of intracortical BCIs, uh, because we do think the future will eventually be intracortical for high performance. Um, there's great work done in other labs on this. You know, for example, uh, Richard Anderson's lab at Caltech, looking at anterior intraparietal area and, you know, how uh, sort of higher level things are encoded there. Uh, you know, there's a group in Cleveland looking at, um, you know, parts of inferior frontal gyrus, which are sequence related. Uh, and so there's probably some, some optimal combination of, of nodes in that, in that motor network. I mean, you could, I mean, if you, if you want to dream big, you could say, well, you know, what if we had SMA premotor, um, inferior frontal gyrus, AIP, and then basal ganglia. So we got like all the motor information. I mean, not all of it. There's clearly other things. The, the, we're, we're becoming increasingly in, uh, increasingly uh, convinced that the whole brain does everything in, in some ways, uh, which is kind of a weird concept. But, uh, but you know, if you could have different types of information from those different nodes in the network, you could uh, probably get, you know, we're always aiming towards get back, getting back to able-bodied levels of control. And that's, that's really what you probably would need would be uh, all of those different parts. Thanks. Well put. Any uh, other comments from our speakers? Closing comments? This was really, it was wonderful to be a part. Really impressive thank to you. see what's going on. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Well, th thank you guys. And we had a lot of attendees, uh, a, a fair amount were international. So we appreciate uh, the interest. Uh, we uh, will have the SSG uh, subcortical surgery group as a users group. And this will be our eighth or ninth year to have the meeting. It will be July 22nd, 23rd in Boulder. You can see the website for more information. Certainly DCI will be a hot topic for that meeting. Uh, we will endeavor to get this, uh, this meeting today transcribed and uh, posted and, and hosted somewhere. And we'll inform you about that as well. So thanks everyone. Uh, we certainly appreciate our speakers and all their expertise and the hard work that they and their teams have done and uh, for all of your attendees. Uh, good night and thanks for participating.